Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is the principles of photodynamic therapy. I'm quite sure that this is a topic that has confused you since a long time because uh, there is most of the departments lack this uh, therapy and uh, we are not doing photodynamic therapy on regular basis. Um, and uh, further, um, most of uh, the consultants or uh, the uh, trainers, they are uh, unaware of the principles of this therapy. So um, this is uh, a very important topic and uh, it is especially important once we are uh, discussing the management of uh, certain skin tumors. So uh, the first question is, what is the photodynamic therapy? Photodynamic therapy is the treatment with three key components. This is important to remember. Number one, a tissue localized photosensitizer that is applied on the target. Then photochemical activation by light or appropriate wavelength. The uh, tissue localized photosensitizer is activated by some appropriate light, uh, creating a photochemical reaction. And as a result of the reaction, number three thing occur, that is the oxygen radical production that results in oxidative stress, inflammation, and cell death, or in the target tissue. So these are the three components, key components of the photodynamic therapy. Systemic or topical photosensitization, both can be used, but in dermatology treatments, topical photosensitizers are used. During the photodynamic therapy, photosensitizers absorbs light and is photochemically activated and converted to high energy singlet state when it returns to the ground state and fluorescence occurs. So the the whole, uh, this whole mechanism or the therapy is based on these three above principles, that is a photosensitizer, then a light, and then an oxidative reaction. Both type one and type two photooxidative reactions occur. Type one photooxidative reactions involves direct hydrogen and electron transfer from the triplet state of the photosensitizers to the substrate. Then type two occur when electron or energy are transferred to molecular oxygen in ground state and singlet oxygen is generated. So in type two, the singlet oxygen are produced while in type one reaction, direct oxygen and electron transfer occur. The generation of reactive oxygen species, in particular the singlet oxygen, is thought to be important in causing nuclear, mitochondrial, and membrane damage of the target and in initiating signal pathways with subsequent. So what this subsequent reaction occur by gene transcription, pro-inflammatory changes, cell cycle arrest, apoptosis, and necrosis. So just remember that these oxidative reactions, which are produced as a result of light uh, photochemically activating the photosensitizer, will result in all these five effects, that is the gene transcription, inflammatory changes, cell cycle arrest, apoptosis, and necrosis, affecting nuclei, mitochondria, and membrane, and hence damaging the target tissue. In vivo studies have shown that prostaglandin E2, histamine, and nitric oxide are released following topical photodynamic therapy. Topical photodynamic therapy is immunosuppressive in humans 
and reduce the epidermal Langerhans cell number after exposure. Paradoxically, widely and effectively used in treatment of skin malignancy and dysplasias. So topical photodynamic therapy at one um, point is immunosuppressive because it suppresses the different markers of immunity. And in addition to that, it is also effective in the treatment of skin malignancies and dysplasias, especially in organ transplant patient where the patient is already immunosuppressed. Effects of photodynamic therapy on vasculature that include the endothelial cell damage, vasoconstriction, vessel occlusion are considered important for systemic photodynamic therapy where photosensitizers delivery is principally via the vasculature, that is IV infusion. To date, however, there is no evidence of any carcinogenic effect of photodynamic therapy, whether systemic or topical. Interestingly, the cutaneous photodynamic therapy may have an important role in delaying the development of actinic keratosis and invasive squamous cell carcinoma in organ transplant patient, which is one of the major indications of this therapy. What is an ideal photosensitizer? The ideal photosensitizers need to, number one, accumulate in the target tissue. Number two, absorb light at clinically relevant wavelength. Number three, is photochemically activated efficiently. Number four, have rapid clearance from the body. And number five, has minimal dark toxicity. So all those chemicals which fulfill these five criteria are used as a photosensitizers in photodynamic therapy. Several chemicals have been investigated for their potential use in systemic photodynamic therapy. And these chemicals include porphyrins, chlorins, porphines, um, phyta, uh, phyta, uh, phytalocyanines, and texapyrins. The principal systemic photosensitizer in current use for photodynamic therapy are porphymer sodium for lung and esophageal cancers and timoporphin for head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Both are associated with prolonged photosensitivity to visible light over several weeks. And there is also a risk of phototoxicity occurring at site of injection if extravasation occur, which is of course not desirable. So the main complication or problem with systemic photodynamic therapy is that the photosensitivity which is induced by the systemic photosensitizers persists for several weeks and there is a chance to develop a phototoxic reaction at the site of infusion. Furthermore, systemic 5 immunolevulonic acid may cause gastrointestinal upset and hepatotoxicity, so it is rarely used. Systemic photodynamic therapy is used in dermatology in gorlin nevoid BCC syndrome and for treating large areas, for example, extensive vulval intraepithelial neoplasia. Photosensitizers used for photodynamic therapy in dermatology. So now we have we are concerned or we are focusing our attention to the dermatology. The topical porphyrin photodynamic therapy employs the principles of heme cycle. A known photosensitizer prodrug is used. The licensed prodrug is uh, in current use are aminolevulonic acid and methyl esters of aminolevulonic acid, the methyl aminolevulinate, uh, which penetrates the epidermis due to low molecular weight. 
following the application of prodrug to the skin, usually a superficial non-melanoma skin cancer or dysplasia and uptake, it is converted into protoporphyrin 9. This is a potent photosensitizer which can be activated by light of appropriate wavelength. So, the crux of this um, uh, slide is that uh, the uh, topical application, uh, the, 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 the topical application in dermatologic photodynamic therapy is mainly by a prodrug. And there are two kinds of prodrugs, either aminolevulonic acid or methyl aminolevulonate. Both of these drugs, once um, applied and uh, taken up by the body, they pass through the heme cycle and is converted and are converted into protoporphyrin 9. Now, this protoporphyrin 9 is the photosensitizer and will, uh, will exert its effect uh, after uh, application of light uh, to the target tissue. So the prodrug is not photosensitizer, but the resultant chemical which is produced, that is protoporphyrin 9, is a photosensitizer. So this is the heme cycle. And you can see these rate limiting steps are two. Number one is the allosynthetase, and number two is the ferrochelatase. So what uh, we are doing here, that uh, by giving aminolevulonic acid directly, applying it on the skin, uh, we are um, promoting its conversion, increased conversion directly into protoporphyrin 9. It has a short half-life. The protoporphyrin 9 has a short half-life and is cleared in 24 to 48 hours, which is one of the requirements of a good photosensitizer. Protoporphyrin 9 has a characteristic crimson red fluorescence when exposed to wood light or UVA light, a phenomena that can be used diagnostically, for example, in delineating the skin tumor margin. So after some appropriate time, when we expect the prodrug to convert into protoporphyrin 9, the uh, place where uh, the prodrug is applied, it, the fluorescence can be checked by Wood's light, and it shows that the appropriate conversion of the prodrug to protoporphyrin 9 has occurred. Surface measurement six hour after topical L application shows that protoporphyrin 9 fluorescence in non-melanoma skin cancer is up to 15 times more intense than in adjacent skin. So in six hours, appropriate conversion of the prodrug to protoporphyrin occur, and the concentration of protoporphyrin is 15 times higher at the place where it is applied compared to the adjacent skin. It is likely that altered permeability of stratum corneum overlying a skin cancer or precancer facilitates the uptake of these small molecules. So this, this statement shows that um, the conversion that the uptake of the prodrug and conversion of the prodrug into uh, the um, photosensitizer is facilitated by the altered permeability of stratum corneum overlying the skin cancers. Factors that are involved in determining the relative specificity of protoporphyrin 9 accumulation in the diseased skin. The relative iron deficiency. If there is an iron deficiency, the um, protoporphyrin accumulation is increased. Altered heme cycle expression, change in pH, and state of differentiation in the diseased tissue. Licensed ELA or MAO. Many of the earlier published studies of topical photodynamic therapy used non-licensed proprietary preparation of aminolevulonic acid. 
However, approved license preparation of both aminolevulonic acid and methyl aminolevulonate are now available. MAL is available as Metvix or Metvixia, which is 16% methyl aminolevulonate by Goldham and is used for actinic keratosis, bone disease, and superficial BCC. More recently, ELA in non-colloid emulsion as Amylus 8% from BioFrontera have been approved as a licensed product. The penetration enhancer. We have mentioned before that the penetration and uptake of the pro-drug and conversion into a photosensitizer has to be facilitated for the maximum effect. So how is this achieved? Development and formulation of pro-drug delivery include use of penetration enhancers or iron chelators such as dimethyl sulfoxide DMSO, desferioxamine and hydroxypyridinone. Physical methods to improve the pro-drug uptake are also under investigation that include the laser pretreatment or microneedling of the target tissue. So penetration enhancers will, will increase the penetration of pro-drug and definitely increase the accumulation of photosensitizer in the target area. Light source. Majority of photosensitizers used in photodynamic therapy absorb maximally in visible wave bands. Absorption of porphyrin is broad with its peak absorption in the solid band, which is around 410 nanometer. So the solid band, which is a popular band, which is uh, the main and uh, wavelength of light, that uh, is associated with sun sensitivity in porphyrias is at 410 nanometer. And there are several other absorption peaks between 500 to 650 nanometer. The short wavelength in blue violet range that is 400 to 450 nanometer are the most potent potent at activating the protoporphyrin 9 in vitro. But tissue penetration in vivo is limited to 1 to 2 millimeter. We all know that the shorter the wavelength are, less is the penetration in the tissue. Longer the wavelength penetrates more. So although the wavelength in blue and violet range, that is 400 to 450, they have, uh, um, they are very potent or most potent in activating protoporphyrin 9, but they cannot penetrate more than 1 to 2 millimeter. On the other hand, at the red light uh, wavelength that is 630 to 635 nanometer, the activation of porphyrin 9 is less than above but it has an advantage that it penetrates up to 6 to 7 millimeter. So it can target the thicker lesions as well. So this is the absorption spectrum of protoporphyrin 9. You can see the maximum absorption is at the solid band that is 410 nanometer and the absorption decreases by 450 nanometer. And then there is a little bit of absorption at the uh, range of 600, 500 to 600 nanometer. In the limited studies that have been undertaken, there is no evidence that the efficacy of topical photodynamic therapy is superior if laser rather than a polychromatic light source is used. So these studies have uh, equalized the effect of laser and polychromatic light source. Indeed, there are theoretical ground for supposing that polychromatic source might be more effective. 
So as far as the photodynamic therapy is concerned, we don't want, or rather we prefer, a polychromatic source over a monochromatic uh, laser. The range of polychromatic light source has been used, a range of polychromatic light source has been used in photodynamic therapy that includes filtered tungsten filaments, metal halides, short arc xenon source, and with the peak emission between 630 to 635 nanometer, which we have already mentioned. The laser source that include the dye lasers, pulse dye laser, the diode laser or even IPL may be successfully used as an alternate to photodynamic therapy. In recent years, emergence of LED for photodynamic therapy has resulted in availability of compact, cheap, and easy to maintain source of relatively uniform irradiance which can be used to treat field diameter or up to 20 centimeter. In order to avoid the thermal effect, light energy no greater than 50 milliwatt per centimeter square should be delivered to the target. This is important to remember. So in the modern time, the photodynamic therapy is mainly done by LED light, LED lamps, uh, that uh, should deliver energy no greater than 50 milliwatt per centimeter square. This is one of the com one of the frequently used LED light source, and even this kind of LED light can also be used. It is difficult to compare the results of different studies as there are wide variation in treatment parameters used in photodynamic therapy that include the variable in light source, irradius, irradiance, and the dose. Although high irradiance light delivery reduce the treatment time, this may also reduce photodynamic therapy efficacy as a result of rapid oxygen depletion. So high irradiation, irradiation although target the tissue uh, um, well, but also the effect ends quickly because of rapid oxygen depletion. Because all the effect of photodynamic therapy is produced by creation of these uh, singlet oxygens. On the other hand, fractionation of the light delivery as an alternate to low radiance light delivery might be therapeutically beneficial. The timing of the light delivery to coincide with peak photosensitizer accumulation is also important. And for the topical photodynamic therapy, most regimens typically include irradiation three to six hours after product application. So this light irradiation should be approximately uh, at time when the prodrug is converted into the photosensitizer. And this is checked by Wood's light before starting the photodynamic therapy treatment. Blue-green light source may be effective for actinic keratosis, but the depth of effect is limited as we have mentioned that the blue light cannot penetrate beyond 1 to 2 millimeter. The regular calibration of light source is essential for light delivery during photodynamic therapy, as lack of uniformity of irradiation may lead to inaccuracy in dose delivery and consequently suboptimal treatment. So whatever the light source is used, uh, regular calibration is essential so that the light delivers a uniform irradiation. If it does not give a uniform irradiation throughout the light treatment, then there will be inaccuracy in dose delivery and suboptimal results. Furthermore, daylight can also be used in photodynamic therapy. And this is a convenient way for patients 
to treat themselves at home. Although depth of photodynamic effect is limited by the fact that most of the therapeutically effective wavelength in daylight is the blue light spectrum. So in photodynamic, daylight photodynamic therapy, which I'll mention again later on, there is very um, less depth of penetration and uh, only superficial lesions can be treated. Indications. The main indications of photodynamic therapy are the actinic keratosis, intraepithelial carcinomas, Bowen's disease, then superficial basal cell carcinoma. So these are the three major indications. Its role in other skin diseases is not fully established. Photodynamic therapy can be used for multiple large field areas and at sites of poor healing such as below the knee. Topical photodynamic therapy is non-invasive, undertaken on an outpatient basis and treatment can be repeated without any cumulative risk. So these are the features for which we can choose that is non-invasive, can be carried on outpatient basis and there is no cumulative risk. Actinic keratosis. This is the major indication of photodynamic therapy. Topical PDT is effective for thin and moderately thick AK on face and scalp using either MAL or ELA. Reported clearance rate as assessed at three months after treatment. Usually one treatment is done. So the reported clearance rate is around 90%. While there is least as good as those and the results are as good as those with liquid nitrogen or cryotherapy or with topical 5 fluorocuracil But the cosmetic outcome of photodynamic therapy is far superior than all the three therapies mentioned above. There is, however, a relatively high recurrence rate that is 19% at one year. So you can see before and after result of single therapy with photodynamic, single photodynamic therapy treatment. In an intra-subject comparison study, ELA photodynamic therapy is more effective than imikimod for moderately thick AKs and equivalent to imikimod for thin AKs on upper limb, although the patients favored photodynamic therapy. Patch ELA photodynamic therapy is shown to be superior to cryotherapy for mild AKs of face and scalp, but is limited to maximum of six, six single AKs and is not suitable for diffuse actinic, actinic damage, damage or field changes. So patch ELA PDT is used, but for limited AKs. A single PDD treatment may be insufficient and repeat treatment has been shown to improve the response rate, particularly for moderate thick actinic keratosis. Hence, if clinical response is not achieved at three months, then a double treatment cycle, uh, which treatment one week apart would be administered. So first give a one treatment cycle, then after three months, if the appropriate response is not achieved, then we do a double treatment cycle one week apart. It should be noted that response to photodynamic therapy of thick hyperkeratotic actinic keratosis, particularly those on acryl site, is disappointing and may be less than 50%. In one study, MAL-PDT is less effective than cryotherapy for acryl sites. So this is not a good treatment for treatment of actinic keratosis on acryl sites. Photodynamic therapy is ideally suited for field treatment of a clinically damaged skin. It allows large area of subclinical disease to be treated and can be particularly advantageous at site of poor healing such as lower leg where cosmetic outcomes is a significant concern. Furthermore, photodynamic therapy has an important role in management of patients at high risk of invasive squamous cell carcinoma, including those who are heavily photodamaged or have history of multiple SCCs 
or patients who require immunosuppressive medications like organ transplant patients and who are otherwise immunosuppressed. So not only the photodynamic therapy treats the actinic keratosis, but is also effective to treat the um, treat the subclinical disease. So uh, regarding the photodynamic therapy, uh, I was mentioning that not only it is effective in treating the actinic keratosis, but it is also suitable to treat the large area where we suspect a subclinical disease with a good cosmetic outcome. And furthermore, it also reduces the chances of conversion uh, to higher risk invasive squamous cell carcinoma in photodamaged sites. In addition to clearing the existing actinic keratosis, photodynamic therapy reduces the rate of development of new AKs. And reduction in risk of developing SCC, already mentioned. It is more, photodynamic therapy is more effective than 5 fluorouracil in treating AK in organ transplant recipients. And it is also used uh, to treat actinic colitis and uh, at the difficult treatment site where recurrences are common. Both all red, blue, and green light is effective for superficial AKs. Blue light PDT using topical solution of ELA applied for 14 to 18 hours without occlusion and a light source of 10 joules per centimeter square is approved in USA for treatment of moderately thick AKs. However, most approved topical PDT regimens of AK using MAL or ELA employs red light and the dose is about 37.5 joules per centimeter square. So the red light photodynamic therapy is much more popular than the blue light photodynamic therapy. Now about Bowen's disease. Topical MAL-PDT using red light LED irradiation at 37.5 joules per centimeter square is licensed for Bowen's disease with two treatment cycles, one week apart, repeated at three months if there is partial response. So two treatment cycles, one week apart, and repeat after three months if required. Based on the clearance assessed at three months after last treatment, response rate of 86 to 93 percent is expected, with sustained remission of 68 to 71 percent by two years. Topical PDD has been shown in two separate studies to be at least as effective for Bowen's disease as cryotherapy and topical 5 fluorouracil but to be associated with fewer adverse effects and improved cosmetic outcome, which is the hallmark of PDT. The response rates are reduced if there is evidence of microinvasive SCC or high degree of cellular atypia. PDT is not indicated for invasive SCC because of high risk of recurrence and potential for metastasis. So for SEC, it's a big no. Then the third major indication of uh, PDT is the superficial BCC. The same regimen of MAL-PDT as use of Bowen's disease is licensed for the treatment of superficial BCC with double treatment cycle one week apart and repeated after three months if necessary. Here, the clearance rate is 92 to 97% at three months follow-up. The comparison between cryotherapy and PDT, there is no difference in response for superficial BCC, but cosmetic outcome is superior with photodynamic therapy. In another study with topical MAL-PDT, it is inferior to imikimod as assessed by tumor, tumor clearance at 12 months follow-up but equivalent in efficacy with 5 fluorojuracil We are talking about Bowen's disease. So as far as the Bowen disease is concerned, at 12-month follow-up, the treatment with the MAL-PDT is more effective than 5 fluorojuracil and less effective than imukimod. Equivalent efficacy is shown for PDT and surgery for superficial BCC at one year, although improved cosmetic outcome with PDT. 
Topical PDT is inferior to surgery for nodular DCC, of course, with increased recurrence rate of five-year follow-up if we do this for nodular DCC. Only if surgery is contraindicated, PDT should be considered as a treatment option for nodular DCC. Then penetration enhancers like microneedling, laser pretreatment, iron chelators, fractionated regimens have been investigated in an attempt to improve the outcome with photodynamic therapy. Systemic PDT can also be considered for high-risk patients such as those with nevoid DCC, Gorlin syndrome, although patients must be counseled about the prolonged visible light photosensitivity. Other indications for PDT include acne. Topical PDT may be used for inflammatory acne in patients for whom conventional therapies are ineffective or not possible. The adverse effects from the treatment include florid phototoxicity and development of multiple sterile pursues. Viral warts in human papilloma, virus-related neoplasias. Topical PDT may also be effective for recalcitrant viral wart with response rate of approximately 50%, although treatment is often painful and difficult to tolerate. Topical PDT is reported to be effective for genital warts, bovinoid papillosis, vulval intraepithelial neoplasias, and penile intraepithelial neoplasia, that is erythroplasia of curat. Other form of cutaneous neoplasia. There are individual case reports of response of photodynamic therapy with uh, extra memory Paget's disease, the localized cutaneous T cell and B cell lymphoma. In aesthetic dermatology, PDT is advocated for photo rejuvenation, although further work up is required for this indication. Miscellaneous. There are also reports of efficacy of topical PDT in cutaneous leishmaniasis, onychomycosis, leg ulcers, localized scleroderma, cutaneous sarcoid, lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, necrobiasis lipoidica, and granuloma annulare. On the other hand, there is a strong evidence to suggest that PDT is ineffective in psoriasis and porokeratosis. Contraindications. Topical PDT is contraindicated for diseases with metastatic potential, such as invasive SCC or melanoma. Importantly, in highly pigmented lesions such as melanoma or heavily pigmented BCC, red light absorption by melanin may reduce the efficacy of the treatment. Topical PDT is not advisable for thick tumors such as thick nodular BCC or for sclerosed or morphic BCC. Patient with porphyria or xeroderma pigmentosa who are already phototoxic or photodamaged should not be treated with photodynamic therapy. Tumor at high risk sites such as mid phase should also not be considered for topical photodynamic therapy. Methodology and regimen. PDT is ideally suited for elderly frail patients who are able to come for treatment rather than involved in self-treatment. PDT is particularly a good treatment choice for multiple or large low-risk, generally thin lesions with diffuse field changes at the site when the cosmetic outcomes are very important. Diagnosis and patient selection. Detailed history, clinical examination is required to establish the patient's comorbidities that may be relevant, that include diabetes, immunosuppression, peripheral venous insufficiency, and dependent edema, all of which may impair the healing following photodynamic therapy. Immunosuppression may also be increased, uh, may also increase the risk of recurrence. If there is significant dependent edema, compression stockings 
may be advised in order to facilitate healing at the lower leg. If BCC has a histological thickness of more than 2 mm, PDT is generally contraindicated. The site and size of lesion should be assessed and baseline photography should be conducted. It is important that patients are provided with verbal and written information about the treatment and given a consent. Topical PDT generally take place in dermatology departments and involves the patients in a half-day visit. And it is usually undertaken by a nurse or technician with adequate training. Lesion preparation. The lesion preparation is important if there is marked hyperkeratosis or crusting because this impairs the penetration of prodrug. The experimental use of laser pretreatment, microneedling, and penetration enhancers like DMS or iron chelators are investigated with intention in improving the prodrug uptake and porpho, uh, protoporphyrin 9 accumulation. In practice, many centers simply advise the application of white salt paraffin to the lesional skin one to three days prior to treatment in order to soften the hyperkeratosis. Prodrug application. The pro-drug is applied after surface preparation and in practice, MAL 16% or ALA 8% is used. Pro-drug is applied under plastic film occlusion as a thin 1 mm thick layer. Even application to lesion including the rim of about 5 to 10 mm of normal skin around the diseased area. It should be occluded for 3 hours prior to irradi irradiation. If the lesion to be treated is on a light exposed site, then an opaque dressing, that is mepo dressing, should be applied on top of the uh, plastic film, occlusive film, so that PDT reaction do not commence prematurely. Following the pro-drug incubation period, the dressing should be removed and any residual cream wiped from the surface. Wood slide is used to identify uh, when whether protoporphyrin 9 is uh, accumulated uh, because it will give the florence, fluorescence, which is usually limited to the lesional side, which, but can also help in reveal the adjacent areas of subclinical disease because the diseased area is, as I've already mentioned, is more, uh, penetra uh, pen is more permeable and uh, the prodrug tend to absorb more in the sites which are diseased sites. A rim of 5 mm of normally, uh, clinically normal skin should be included in irradiation field. Irradiation now. Irradiation can be performed by a variety of light source. We have already mentioned that the preference is red light LED with peak emission around 630 to 635 nanometer. The irradiation emits, uh, emitted by the source is approximately 80 milliwatt per centimeter square and approved dose for using MAL or ALA PDT is 37.5 joules per centimeter square. Although some centers use higher dose, that is 75 joules per centimeter square, as there are experimental data to increase that increased protoporphyrin 9 photo bleaching may continue if higher doses are used. So uh, there are two school of thoughts. One is uh, by giving the um, 37 joules and other by giving 75 joules. This is the treatment going on. Historically, when polychromatic light source is used, irradiation dose of 125 to 200 joule per centimeter or more could be utilized. However, although it is important that irradiance is kept below 150, to avoid additional thermal effects. Um, so uh, once we are using a focus source that is 632 to 635 nanometer, we can go to uh, 337.5 or 75 joules per centimeter square. But if we are using a polychromatic source emitting multiple wavelength, then we can go to higher uh, higher fluence, that is 125 to 200, but should be kept below 150. The time of irradiation using LED source is generally 
8 to 17 minutes depending upon the dose and irradi irradiance. The lesional field diameter up to 20 cm can be treated with a standard PDD using LED or metal halide source, Walderman 1200R. Then what is ambulatory PDD? Ambulatory PDD employs this principle of very low irradiance light delivery over a prolonged period of time. What is done? A small lightweight portable red LED array with peak emission at 633 nanometer at very low irradiance, that is 7 millijoules per centimeter square, is used for this purpose. In ambulatory PDT regimen, the prodrug, which is mal, is applied to the lesion and occluded uh, tagaderm and LED and the LED device, which is ambulite, is immediately secured in place using adhesive tape over the lesion. You can see the ambulated uh, LED device. The device is programmed to remain switched off for three hours, which is the time given for the prodrug to convert into protoporphyrin 9 and patient go home. And as soon as the device is secured, the operate, it is operated by a battery pack, which is kept in the pocket or with a belt, and patient can do his normal routine activities. After three hours, the device is automatically switched on, and a total dose of 75 joules per centimeter square is delivered over three hour period. The patient then removes the device, wipes the residual cream from the surface and returns the battery pack and disposable head to the clinic. At present, the devices are of size that permit treatment of lesion up to 2.4 cm in diameter. Another type of photodynamic therapy is the daylight photodynamic therapy. The daylight PDT is alternate way to use low irradiance light delivery during PDT. This has advantage of convenience for the patient and large areas are treated in one session. This has been explored for the treatment of AK on face and scalp. Therapeutically affected wavelength, wavelength of daylight is mainly in the blue light pattern and daylight PDT may not have any sufficient depth of effect to treat Bowman's disease or BCC. So it is just meant for thin superficial AKs. This is daylight PDT. In daylight PDT regimen, facial and scalp AK, uh, a sunblock with SPF 50 is applied to all the sites. 15 minutes after the sunscreen application, AK are prepared by using disposable ring curette. Then after cleaning this, a photosensitizer male is applied without occlusion to the area to be treated and patient is advised to expose the affected area to continuous daylight for two hours, preferably starting not later than half an hour after application of the photosensitizer. The photosensitizer is applied and after half an hour, the patient exposes it himself to the daylight and about two hours of exposure is sufficient. In northern latitudes, treatment is undertaken between April and September, while in Australia, it can be taken throughout the year. There is no difference in clearance rate of AK 75 to 79% between daylight and conventional PDT, but daylight PDT is associated with lower pain scores. Treatment schedule, aftercare, and follow. Most topical PDT regimens call for single PDT treatment for AK and two treatment a week apart for bovens and superficial BCC we have already mentioned. Following treatment, a dry dressing should be applied to the treated area. It is advisable to keep the area out of direct sunlight for 24 to 48 hours as photosensitivity can persist. A review at three months and if there is no or partial response, second treatment cycle is undertaken with again two treatments at a week apart. So this is the normal schedule. Further review should be undertaken at six months and patient is ideally followed up by dermatologists at least annually to ensure that clearance is maintained and that no new lesion has erupted. Careful records of all treatment and attendance must be kept. The acute adverse effects. 
The acute phototoxic effects are pain, itch, discomfort, erythema, edema, exudation, and crusting. Erythema peak at about one hour after PDT but persists for seven to ten days. Fair skin photo damaged patients are most at risk of extensive erythema and phototoxicity. For this reason, an initial test area of up to five to five centimeter may be advisable before more widespread treatment of the patient is taken. Periocular edema may occur and patients should be warned of this and advise the sleeping with additional pillow for 48 hours after PDT. Urticaria can occur at the treatment site during or immediately after photodynamic therapy. Infection and cellulitis occur infrequently. Topical PDT is bacteria settled, therefore infection chances are much less. Development of sterile pustules for PDT for acne vulgaris is common and patients should be warned of this adverse effects. Then purpura and bruising is also common. Ulceration at lower leg occur if dependent edema is present. And the use of compression stocking throughout the PDT treatment course. So this is the residual erythema and crusting. This is severe phototoxic reaction after photodynamic therapy. Then this is dermatitis and this is urticarial reaction. The dermatitis and allergy. Dermatitis may occur at the treatment site and may be secondary to the phototoxicity or uh, irritation uh, uh, or be irritant in nature. However, the possibility of allergic contact dermatitis to pro-drug need to be considered as well. Patients who have multiple treatments and treatments to large areas are particularly at risk of this adverse effect. Past testing should be organized if contact allergy is suspected, as further PDD in allergic patient may result in generalized dermatitis. Bullous pemphigoid is reported in a single case localized to the site of photodynamic therapy. Pain. The main acute adverse effect of PDT is pain and most patients experience some discomfort with severe pain in 16 to 20% of the patients. The mechanism of PDT-induced pain is unknown, although it occurs maximally in first few minutes of treatment and is typically of burning, pricking and stabbing in nature. Pain is usually subsided as soon as the irradiation stops. PDT treatment of large lesions and lesions on head and neck and genital sites are more likely to be associated with significant pain. PDT treatment of warts appear to be associated with particular discomfort during the treatment. Cold water sprays and pausing air radiation may prove some relief as the fan or forced air cooling. Pre-treatment with topical tetracaine gel, amala, which is a local anesthetic, capsaicin or morphine does not significantly alleviate the pain. The role of transepidermal nerve stimulation has been investigated, but is of limited use. Subsequent subcutaneous anesthetic and nerve blockade can be used and later can be shown to be more effective than forced air cooling, nerve blockade. It is claimed that mal PDT is of equivalent efficacy, but less painful than ELA PDT. So if pain is a factor, then ELA PDT, uh, mal PDT should be preferred. Irradiation parameters influence the severity of PDT-induced pain. Variable pulse light delivery may be associated with less pain than LED source. Green light is associated with less pain than red light due to limited penetration. Low irradiance LED and daylight PDT indicate the reduced rate of light delivery irradiance and associated with less pain. The chronic adverse effect of PDT include scarring, which is low as 1%. And when it does occur, it is more likely to be atrophic rather than hypertrophic. If dermal epidermal junction is disrupted, myelia may appear, although this is rarely seen. Then other adverse effects include photoonicolysis, hypo or hyperpigmentation, increased or reduced hair growth. Carcinogenicity. There is no evidence of long-term carcinogenic risk in PET in humans. 
However, there is anecdotal reports, for example, with an invasive SCC arising in area of penile intraepithelial neoplasia following PDT and melanoma occurring in actinically damaged skin, previously treated with photodynamic therapy. There is evidence that such events are casually related to PDT. There is also evidence that PDT may retard AK development and that repeated PDT field treatment might possibly reduce the risk of SCC in organ transplant recipients. So it is useful and whatever reports are there, they are mostly casual reports. Clinical governance, despite a good evidence base for topical PDT in dermatology and availability of British and European guidelines and nice interventional procedural guidelines, there remain significant areas where consensus on best practice has yet to be reached. This is particularly true in organizing, managing, and auditing, and crucially agreeing to the criteria for offering patient PDT rather than an altered rather than an alternate treatment modality. So it is still the um, which patient is to be treated on PDT is not very clear and uh, it is mainly presented as an alternate treatment modality rather than having the fixed um, fixed guidelines. There is always a question if we are undertaking a safe and effective PDT. What's new? The field of fluorescence diagnosis has largely been ex uh, experimental, but the use of protoporphyrin 9 to demarcate the disease margins with detailed fluorescence analysis by spectroscopy and charge coupled device has a potential to improve sensitivity and specificity. So what is done currently is use of wood slide to determine the photosensitivity, determine the fluorescence uh, by detecting the protoporphyrin 9. And in future, we can use the fluorescence analyzers by spectroscope or the charge coupled device to highlight this more clearly. The continued development of new drugs and formulation of PDT and mechanisms to enhance the drug uptake and accumulation together with advances in light delivery by using conformable light emitting fabric demonstrate that PDT is evolving treatment modality. So in future, we are expect the new drugs and better light source for a better outcome from PDT. So in conclusion, PDT has many advantages and few adverse effects. Development of improved mechanisms for drug delivery and irradiation will help refine the clinical practice of PDT. The use of non-invasive monitoring may improve efficacy and tolerance. There is great potential for application of PDT in other diverse cutaneous disease, which also require further investigations. So this brings to end of this talk. And I am really thankful for your patient listening and see you next time with another edition of my lectures. Thank you very much and have a good day.